Look, when I see someone mock Christ, I am enraged, right? But rage of the flesh and righteous anger are two separate and distinct things. I have a righteous anger because Christ is holy, his word is holy, God is holy, and we ought to we ought to have a passion and a zeal for that holiness. But the way to respond is by loving in truth. Hey everyone, hopefully you're doing well. Welcome to the Jesus King podcast. Welcome, welcome. I'm here with Abe. How you doing, Abe? Good, good. It's the two of us back together. It is, it is. Mm -hmm. Um, Today is actually a very good topic. Mm. And it's a topic that's very relevant today for us in in the church. And it's to do with mocking God. Yeah. Right? Um, I know there's a lot of videos out there about this topic. But a lot of them are addressing of what happened in the event in the Olympics. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but what we want to do is we want to have that mindset of the judgment starts in the house of God. Yeah. And we want to speak about how sometimes as Christians, we bring mockery to God's name, mm-hmm. right? Whether it's intentionally or not. And what we should do as Christians about it before we actually address what happened in that event. Mm-hmm. So do you want to start somewhere there? Yeah. Um, People look at that as though, see, look at what happened at the Olympics. Look at what the non-believers are doing and how they're mocking our Savior and how they're mocking, you know, certain um, sacred things that we hold dear to ourselves. But these kind of things don't happen in a vacuum. It doesn't happen just overnight. These are things that occur because of a certain progression of, let's say, desensitization or because of like a lack of respect from the source, right? And the source is the Christian church. The source is the the Christendom, the Christian people. How are they viewing Christ? How are they living by the standard of Christ, right? And if they take that seriously, the mockery, the mockery that the world has will be a little different, right? Like in the first few centuries of the church, when Christianity was, when Christians were taking Christianity really seriously, the direction was at the people of God, right? That would attack them, that would scorn them, that would persecute them, that would throw them to the to the lions, throw them into the Colosseum, that kind of thing. So there was a direct attack. Today, we look at the mockery of the, the world. They see that Christians are not really taking seriously mm-hmm. the standard and the word of Christ. So they can go directly to just the sacred things that we hold dear and be like, yep, well, we can just mock it because they're not really taking it seriously either. And so, again, this is where we say maybe we need to take a step back, review and assess and be like, well, judgment does need to begin with us. We need to take the log out of our eye before taking the speck out of theirs. And so we see what's happened at the Olympics. And we see, it's not just that. I mean, the world has been mocking Christ for a long time. But we look at that and we think, okay, well, that's terrible. But there's been a lot of mockery in the Christian church for a long, long, long time. And we've had on the pulpit people saying things that are just disrespecting and blaspheming the name of the Lord for for centuries, all right. But in the last hundred years, after the the you know the sexual revolution and that kind of um, permeation into the church and it's corrupted the church, they've taken that. And what they've done is they've said, all right, well we're going to water down the word of God to make it more relevant for people so that they would accept our message rather than the original message. And that's given occasion for mockery to begin from the pulpit, from the people of God. And I use that term loosely. And then the world looks at that and like these people are an absolute joke, right? I mean, you have drag queen pastors and you have drag queen ordained ministers who are on the pulpit just making a mockery of the Christian institution. And then we get angry at the world for doing something like they did at the Olympics. Yeah. So it's just, a, it's it's kind of like a, it's it's an uneven scale kind of thing. Yeah. So I'm not very concerned about mocking what happened, uh, about um, judging what happened at the Olympics. I kind of get it. They're the world. The world's going to do what the world does. 
but I'm mainly concerned about the mockery that's happening in Christendom amongst those who are bearing the name of Jesus. So what you're trying to say, if we're not actually showing that reverence towards the Lord within the church, mm. you can't expect the world to do the same. Even yeah. though the world by nature is an enemy of God, mm -hmm. but to them it's like, well, the church doesn't even take its religion seriously. Yeah. So what is what's what's the point of us taking you guys seriously? Yeah. That's that's on a kind of on a grand on a yeah on a, on a grand, grand scale. scale. I look at it from a, a Christian history perspective. All right, you look at it from the beginning of Acts. You see that the the message of the gospel that's that permeates in a culture it actually restrains the evil of that culture, and the culture actually becomes gradually more righteous as as the gospel is preached. And so the Western world is based on that, that message yeah. of the gospel, that preaching of the gospel. What's happened in the last few decades, let's say the last century and a half, is because the gospel is not preached with such rigor anymore and it's been watered down, the restraining of the culture, that restraining of evil, or that restraining of the mockery of God is being loosened. Because there's not that gospel, there's not that um, that message of Christ and that message of righteousness being preached. And so mockery is just kind of let loose in a way. And so we see the degrading of the culture, but we see the degrading of the culture because of the degrading of the church first. Yeah, and, and that kind of reminds me of Romans chapter 2. Yeah. Where Paul is speaking to the believers and he's using Israel as an example. Mm -hmm. And because Israel did not live up to the law of God or even tried to, he's saying, because of your actions, other nations blasphemed God. So it's that we can even invite mockery yeah. to God yeah. Yeah. with the way that we're living as Christians. Yeah. And I think even if you want to go a bit further with Paul in uh, Galatians 6, mm -hmm. he's speaking on a personal level. He's saying, don't be deceived. What you're sowing, it, it, what you'll reap is what, what you've already sowed. And God cannot be mocked mm -hmm. by that. So the idea that even Christians, we, we try and influence God in, in some way or another, or we try and live a certain life and mm -hmm. expect a different outcome. Yeah. And yeah. Paul is saying, no, the way you live, that's the fruits that you're going to produce. Yeah. We want all the is... blessings of God without the sacrifice, yeah. without actually living according to his... And word. and to have both feet in each world, yeah. right? You yeah. want to enjoy the world and you want to enjoy the blessings of God. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because the, pr the previous chapter in Galatians 5, it speaks about the way we walk, whether we are walking in the flesh or whether we're walking in the spirit. Mm -hmm. It's we're going to produce a fruit yep. to a certain lifestyle yep. that we're doing. If we're walking in the spirit, it's going to be patience, kindness, goodness. It's going to be joy. Mm -hmm. It's going to be love. But if we're walking in the flesh, we're just bringing, we're producing sin. That's yep. going to be our 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 um, um, our fruits. Yeah. So I, I think it's a very important time for us to even look at ourselves. Yeah. And say, I want to start with myself. Am I bringing mockery to God's name? Yeah. I could be a Christian who's in a workplace, yeah. but I'm doing everything that my friends are doing, right? I might be drinking, swearing, mm -hmm. um, getting into all these dirty jokes together. Yeah. But then when they ask me, oh, what do you think about what happened? Oh, I'm a Christian. I really hate what happened. Yeah, yeah. It's but disgusting. There, yeah. But there you are doing the most debaucherous things in your own life and yeah. they see that. Yeah. So, so the idea is that you could disagree with what happened. And we're mm -hmm. going to get to that because we actually want to speak about that. But then if we're inviting that kind of mockery through our lifestyle, then it's just hypocrisy. It, it, it's yeah, not something that yeah, you well, can... it's interesting because it wasn't just Christians that were outraged by it. You had Muslims outraged by it. You had even you know other religions yeah. and were not, who were outraged by what happened, and yet they live totally opposite to the will of Christ and to what yeah. Christ says. So people can be outraged by that, but what we're trying, what we're trying to focus in on is, okay, that's the meta, that's the mockery of the world. But what's going on here? Where, where the Christians who are supposed to bear the name of Jesus, what's going on here that 
they're living in total opposition to the words of Christ and to yeah. the righteousness of Christ. It's it's a very it's a it's a simple thing and yet it's something complex because I think it's happened over a long time in our culture. Like we look at, for example, the commandments. Um the commandments that God gives to the people of Israel, the the commandment that you shall not take the name of the Lord in vain, right? So don't take the name of the Lord in vain. Now, one of the literal interpretations of that is don't say the name of Yahweh in a fleeting or trivial way, right? But it's actually a deeper interpretation. There's actually a deeper meaning to that. It's not necessarily don't just say the name of God. Like, oh my God, like people think that's blasphemy. It's more than that. It's actually taking the name of Yahweh, the name of God, all right, onto yourself and saying, I am his follower. I am his, his devoted disciple. I am his chosen person, chosen people. And then living outside of his will and outside of his standard. Because if you say, I have the name of the Lord stamped on me, Right? And then you live like anyone else in the world who is a disbeliever. You are taking the name of the Lord in vain. And we as Christians, literally it's in the name. It's little Christ. We have the name of the Lord on us. And then we go and live in a way that is completely opposite to what G how Jesus lived and how he commanded us to live. Right? He commanded us to live in the Spirit. He commanded us to, to live by the ethics of loving God and loving others. He commanded us to live in a way that opposes sin and opposes evil and looks to the good right? and looks to do good for the world and for the, the, um, for the kingdom of the Lord. And you have those two elements there and you think, okay, well, if we bear the name of Jesus, like you were saying, and then we are going out and living like any debaucherous individual. You know, like we have people who are Christians and they take that grace, like, you know, the Corinthian church, and then yep. they, they take it for granted. And they bring to shame the things that Christ has died for. Like, so they, they bring to shame the gospel. And what you have is what Paul says to the Corinthians. He says, even what you were doing, even the pagans don't do. Right, the the sins that you are committing, even the pagans don't do because you're taking that grace for granted, taking advantage of the grace that Christ has given you. Um, and so, like we're saying, like it's not necessarily that we are being saved by our good works and by being holy, but because we are saved, we are to be holy. Right, because we are saved, we have the Spirit of God that leads us in a way that we don't mock the Lord in our lives. We don't mock His. His standard. We don't mock the standard of grace and the standard of the Spirit. We live in a way that the Spirit leads us so that we bring glory to the Lord, so that we are a holy people, right? That's literally the, the name of, of the church. You know, we are a royal priesthood. We are chosen people. We are, we are a holy nation unto God, right? Yeah. And that's amazing because it's important as Christians. We always think that all the work is on God. What he gets done, he, he does everything, mm -hmm. and he's the one that looks good. And I just come as a sinner, and just take me as I am, and so yeah. on. But they don't understand that once you become a Christian, you become an ambassador yeah. of Christ. So that means you're representing Him on this world. Even the church is known to be the body of mm -hmm. Christ. So we're the moving parts. We're the visible part of Christ on this earth. And if we're not shining our light in a transparent and clear way, then people can easily see those blemishes in us. Mm -hmm. And I understand no one is perfect. And as much as you try, you're not going to be able to live a perfect life in front of people. But the point is, there are people just like their father, the devil. He, he is an accuser, and so they will be. Yeah. Right? They're going to come and try and find any way to accuse a believer yeah right yeah. oh you 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 drink you swear you smoke you do you lie um you sleep around what, whatever it is why don't we repent of our sins put these away so when we come to these people and share the gospel mm -hmm. they can get to see christ in us yeah. they get to see okay this person has actually changed you know a lot of people 
when, when they hear the gospel from their family members or friends, they don't pay attention because they're like, you still live like me. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, What's the difference? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You come and live the same way I live, do the same things I do. Mm. All you have is a batch of Christianity. Yeah. That, that, that's a title for you. But then if we show transformation in our lives, people are not going to mock the gospel. Mm. People are going to come and be like, wait, there is a difference in this person's life. I want to have something like that. And there are a lot of people who are very desperate to change their lives today. Mm -hmm. It's very important. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have a, we have a, like an epidemic, especially amongst our young people. They're looking for substance. They're looking for something that they can cling on to. That's beyond just the, that's, that's beyond the temporal because they're going through this crisis where they're like, well, what's really this life about, right? They want a change. They, they know that living out the hedonistic pleasures and just fulfilling the desires of their flesh, they know that's fleeting because they do that every day and they're not fulfilled. They're not satisfied. So the world is looking for something of substance, but they need to see that through the body of Christ. We are the, we are the hands and we are the feet of Christ. And so... They are looking for something of substance. They are looking for something to cling on to. And they need to see that in us as his representatives, as you said, as his ambassadors. And that's what Christ has instituted the church for. That's what he built the church for. It's that we would go out, we would be the light, right? We would be salt. We would go and, you know, salt is a preservative. We're supposed to preserve the culture through the preaching of the gospel. And light is the direction. We're directing people to the way, the truth, the life. And culture and history has benefited because of that and now we're getting to a point where it's devolving it's going backwards yeah right? and it's it starts here it starts with the preaching of the word and so unless we start to wake up each individual christian and the church as a whole unless we start to wake up reassess repent humble ourselves before the lord we're not going to see this get better we're not going to see mockery of the word of god and of god get better we're going to see it get worse and it, hap it doesn't happen overnight, but it happens in stages and we're going to see a collapse ultimately. And maybe that collapse may be the catalyst for revival and it might be the catalyst for the people of God to wake up again. But I hope it doesn't have to get to that stage. Yeah. If you, know. you don't want things to get really bad yeah, and like, things get yeah. well. Because, I mean, the only thing we want as, as Christians is... For the church to be nourished in the word of God, yeah. for it to be growing, for it to be gospel-centered, Christ-centered, for it to be love-centered. Mm. And not love in the way that we want to define love, is the way that the word of God defines love. And that's important. But let's come to the second part of the video. We spoke about how sometimes we, on our personal lives mm -hmm. we bring mockery to god's name yeah we spoke about how through our lives um others can bring mockery to god's name mm -hmm. but let's speak about now where the world in their own evil ways yeah they they want to mock god mm -hmm. right even if you don't show anything that they can point out to mock yeah. god yeah. They just want to mock God. And that's what happened with the Olympics. Mm -hmm. So they they showed the opening ceremony and there was, you know, a group of people sitting behind a table which looked like a the last, last supper. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously they came back and they did some damage control. They yeah. said, no, it's not that. A bit, it's... Of, bit of gaslighting, in my opinion. <laughs> like They was like, oh, we're going to do this procession and it's going to be all about, you know, the last supper and then they come back like no no it wasn't the last supper it just looked like that right because they saw the outrage and whatnot so it, it seemed like a gaslighting thing but you know let god be the judge of that yeah <laughs> yeah how do you but feel about that man i i i genuinely see that like i do believe that what they were doing was mocking or, or bringing to forefront like because they had they had this happen over <clears throat> over a period of time where they had the He Gets Us movement. Do you know the He Gets yeah, Us, right? Yeah. Where it was kind of incorporating the the Jesus of the 21st century and shaping Jesus into the 21st century and saying, well, if Jesus were here today, then he would advocate for the transgender and the LGBT movement, right? So we had this 
over many, many years. It wasn't just something that happened here. Then we had, you know, certain skits of transgender Jesus. And we had certain skits where Jesus, you know, was bisexual, where he was he was um, a transgender male. Or, you know, certain preachers were saying, well, Jesus actually was non-gender, right? And that's why he didn't marry. Things like that. It was just some extremely mocking and blasphemous stuff that were that have been happening over a period of time and then you get to the olympics and you see okay a bunch of transgender drag queens sitting in the formation of the last supper painting with you know the woman or whoever was in the middle with a halo right yeah which is the exact portrait and painting so i don't think that was a coincidence i definitely believe that they were they were aiming at that and targeting at that. And because France is very liberal in that sense, I do believe that was very targeted. Um, but then they saw the outrage. They saw the people that were looking to boycott and they did the damage control and said it was uh, the Feast of Dion- Dionysus. And so you're like, all right, well, you know, <laughs> um, if that's the route you want to go where you want to mock but to no consequence, then that's your route. God will judge you for that. But um, I do look at it as a a cultural issue. We've had decades since the 50s and 60s, after the sexual revolution, and after the feminist movement, and after um, the the many uh, innovations of hu- human culture mm-hmm. after the 50s, you have a, a, a strategic agenda where it's like where we want hedonism and we not we want humanism above the word of god which has been kind of floating our culture for for all this time we want to live out the desires of our flesh we want to go by our feelings and so you see that permeation from the 60s and the 70s and you see it creep up until today where it gets to that point but in saying that I mean, you don't need to give reason for a non-believer to mock God. They're going to mock God. Darkness and light, there's always that tension, right? They don't understand the light and they don't need any any major excuse to say, hey, you know, um, this Jesus is just complete foolishness because the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing. Um, So this is something that completely happens. Now they're just more outward about it because of, this rise in lib- progressive liberalism. Yeah. So it's just they're, they're able to be obvious because yeah. there's not that pushback anymore where the church has been a stronghold against them. Now, that's a good point that you're showing that now outwardly they're trying to manifest these things. Mm-hmm. And that kind of reminds me of Romans chapter 1 yeah. where it speaks about that they no longer wanted to worship the creator and they started to worship, worship the, the creation, creation, right? And they kind of swapped the truth for a lie and mm. they gave in to their own desires and yep. these were homosexual desires and so on so it as you said they don't need to have an excuse mm-hmm. a lot of times as christians um as we spoke about in the first part we think okay what are we doing that they did this mm. sometimes they just do this because yeah. of their own nature and that happens but I want to get your view on this because you've had even a lot of influences or internet celebrities that came out and they saying, well, Christians are weak minded. Yeah. Christians are not strong in their beliefs. They don't believe in all that because if they did, there would be riots all over the world or, yeah. you know, cities will might be burning or something like that. How should we react to this? And again, what's the Christian response? Yes, the Christian response ought to be that we call this out. This is mockery. Um, Our Lord and Savior, who is he? What's the gospel about? Come back to that and respond genuinely in a way of love and truth. Okay. Um, We have certain influencers and let's say Andrew Tate, for example. He said he converted to Islam because Islam is the last religion that defends itself. Mm -hmm. Right. And you have other people who do the same thing because... When someone mocks the Prophet Muhammad, they riot and they get violent and they get angry and they will do things that gets the attention of the world so that no one does it again. We don't do that as Christians. We ought not to. Rioting and getting violent and doing these things, it's not the way of 
Christ. That's it's not the way the of the flesh. It's the way of the flesh. Look, when I see someone mock Christ, I am enraged, right? But rage of the flesh and righteous anger are two separate and distinct things. I have a righteous anger because Christ is holy, His Word is holy, God is holy, and we ought to we ought to have a passion and a zeal for that holiness. But the way to respond is by loving in truth, by preaching the truth and saying, this is evil, it is wickedness, we're not going to get violent with you, we're not going to go and, and, and you know, declare an all-out war against you in the flesh, but we are going to, we are going to implement a spiritual war here. We're going to get around here. We're going to pray. We're going to preach the gospel. We're not going to let any of you mock Christ without you knowing fully who he is. Right? I I think James points something on that, as you were mentioning, saying that the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of man. So, I mean, if we're going to fall into the trap of the world telling us how to behave, Mm. then are they asking us to behave like them? Yeah. How they would react? But Christ didn't call us to behave that way. In fact, even when he was preaching um, in Matthew 5, he says, you know, love those who hate you. You know, pray for those who persecute Mm -hmm. you. Bless those who curse you. And he even speaks about the blessings that we receive in our persecution. You know, for for righteousness sake. the, The molding of the Christian character as well. This is a good thing in our character development and in our transformation to the image of Christ. Because Christ promised us that if they called the master Beelzebub, Imagine what they're going to call his followers, yeah. right? So don't expect a better treatment than what Jesus received. And I, I'm, I'm reminded by um, the first few centuries of Christianity with Justin Martyr. There were a lot of mockeries of, of the Roman Empire against Christians. And they were looking at the things Christians were doing. And they're like, look at these cannibals eating the blood and the body of their savior. Um, they yeah. literally thought they were cannibals. And they thought that, you know, excuse my language, but they thought that the Christians were coming together for sex parties and doing a bunch of evil, debaucherous stuff. And Justin Martyr, his response was not anger and violence and and doing things the way other people would as a natural response. What he did was he created his apology, which is where, you know, the kind of the first apologetic letter where he created and formatted this apology and this description of what the Christian faith is targeting against all those arguments, right? So it was kind of like the the first formation of a defense for Christ and a defense for the Christian faith. And it, it was an amazing thing because it really, it brought to the culture an understanding of what Christianity truly was about. And they saw that in in they saw that in the fruit of Christians because the Christians were just a loving people. There were people that loved, that gave. There were people that um, devoted themselves to the bettering of society and the bettering of culture. Mm-hmm. They see someone who's homeless, they take him in. They see someone who's naked, they clothe them. They see yeah. someone who's hungry, they feed them. These are the things that Christians were doing all throughout history, and the world sees it. And they're kind of fine with the good that Christianity does in that sense. They're not fine with the preaching of the truth. Yeah. Right? So when you're actually preaching the gospel. You know, they they were fine when Jesus was feeding them. They weren't fine when he was claiming to be God. Right? And so this is where, where for the world, they use... They use anything that Christianity Christians would do, even if we do something that is of reproach, even if we do something that is evil, they'll use that as a as as reason for us not to take Christianity seriously. Yeah, and that it, kind of that's a good point, and and that kind of sheds light on a different perspective. Mm-hmm. Is a lot of people uh, because they can't see anything wrong in you. They try and mock you to get a reaction out of you. And if we Christians fall into that, then we we basically kind of failed that test. But if we actually react the way Christ wants us to react, I think that's where we pass the test. Well, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, that's very interesting because, yeah. Because what they want to do is like, okay, Christians have that high standard, that, Mm. that level of righteousness that they live up to. 
and we're down here. Let's bring them out of their pedestal. Yeah. 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 Just like on the cross, they were mocking Jesus, saying, yeah. oh, if you're the son of God, come down. Come down yeah. So I think that's also a good point to say, okay, maybe the person that's mocking God and mocking you, maybe they want to see a reaction out of you. Maybe they want to see the flesh coming out. Well, Peter fell into that. Remember when they when they're coming to when they were coming to arrest Jesus, the response of Peter in the flesh was wrath. that's it, wrath. Yeah. And the wrath of the flesh was what dominated in his perspective and in his response. But Christ was like, put the sword away. This is not the way. This is not the response. Mm-hmm. All right. The wrath of God is already on these people. Yeah, true. Right? So the wrath of God is already on them. You don't need to you don't need to add on to that. What you need to do is bring them out of that wrath of God so that what we do, our response is they're mocking Jesus. Mm-hmm. They're mocking the Lord. Our response is let's preach the word of the Lord to them so that they would come from darkness to life and therefore Christ wins, right? Yeah. Because now they no longer mock the Lord because they are one of his. That's yeah. our response. That's our mission. My When I see someone who's mocking Christ, I'm like, I pray that person comes to Christ so that his mockery turns into glory. Amen. Um, I just want to sh- mention yeah. James yeah. 1, 19 and 20, which we've yeah. been speaking about, just in case you're like, where, where is that verse? But I want to read the verse before that because it's important. He's saying, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Mm. Any last words you want to share? Any advice you want to give a Christian when it comes to them being in that place where they hear a mockery of Christ? How how should they deal with that situation? There, There are some really vile people out there. There are some very wicked people who will say very wicked things and who will do wicked things to you, to me, to anyone for the name of Christ. And they will mock and they are they are merciless. And our response must be, as James said, he's describing the very character of Jesus here. That's how Jesus reacted. Our response ought to be, if Christ endured with such confidence in the Lord and such peace and with such a joy looking to what was ahead, this is the same way we ought to be. We know the end. We know the end result. And we look to that. And so in this temporal moment, in this light affliction, all right, we ought to endure it with all joy. Be calm. Don't get angry. Don't let your flesh get the best of you. Preach the gospel. Pray without ceasing. And that's pretty much all. Amen. Uh, to be honest with you, it's a very nice topic to speak about. Yeah you know, mockery and when it comes to people mocking Christ. And maybe we might even do a second episode on that. Mm. So we'll see how God leads us on that. So God bless you. Enjoy your day. Take care.